Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Solar Observatory's live Learn From Home webinar. Today we're featuring Dr. Sarah Yegley, a scientist and assistant astronomer for the National Science Foundation's Inoue Solar Telescope on Maui, which is currently the largest solar telescope in the world and has just recently captured the highest quality image of our sun's surface ever taken. Dr. Yegley is a scientist for the Diffraction Limited Near Infrared Spectropolarimeter, one of the advanced instruments for the telescope. She went to school at the University of Arizona, where she earned her bachelor's of science in physics and astronomy, and then went on to the University of Hawaii, where she received both a master's and a PhD in astronomy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah, Dr. Yegley. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So today I wanted to talk to you about what I think is a cool problem. Um, and I think it demonstrates how really well how scientists can form a hypothesis and we use the scientific method to do that. Um, I, like Tashana said, I'm a scientist at DKIST. I'm a solar astronomer. So that means I use a telescope to look at the sun. Um, DKIST is a very brand new telescope on Maui and it's almost finished being built. Um, this is a picture of the telescope. Of course, it doesn't have all that popcorn in front of it. I think that's just a, a fun picture. Um, so what is DKIST? Um, so it stands, the acronym DKIST, D-K-I-S-T, stands for the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. It's named after Senator Daniel K. Inoue, who is very important in convincing Congress to give us the money to build this telescope. So they, Congress gave money to the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation gave that money to the National Solar Observatory in order to build the telescope. So DKIST is located at the top of Haleakala, a mountain on the island of Maui in Hawaii in the United States. Um, Haleakala is a very beautiful mountain. This is a picture down here of what it looks like there. The skies are very clear and blue and it makes it a really excellent site for looking at the sun. And DKIST is the newest and most advanced solar telescope ever built. Um, and it's even for a nighttime telescope, it's also quite an advanced facility. It's very complicated and there are a lot of engineering problems to solve. And it's almost finished being built. I'm working on building one of the instruments um, right now. It's being transported up to the summit of Haleakala, or I guess not right now, because we're interrupted. So parts of it are down in the lab here on Maui, closer to sea level, and parts of it are up at the telescope, partially assembled. So this is the state of Hawaii. It's made up of several different islands. Maui is just one of those islands. So it's this one, sort of shaped like a head and shoulders, I think. And Haleakala is on the big side of that head and shoulders. And Dikis is located up at the summit, and that's where it is. And right now, I'm down here, a little bit lower elevation. So this is what DKIST looks like on the inside. So up underneath the dome is the telescope. That telescope collects sunlight and focuses it. And the focused sunlight is then sent down through this mechanical structure into an instrument lab where all of the instruments are housed. That's all of, the, all of the very fancy cameras and optics go into this level. And that's where we make pictures of the sun. And there's a lot of structure here and it's all to hold the telescope, to keep it cool, to keep people safe. Um, and it's all very complicated. It rotates, it moves. Um, the, the instrument lab down here rotates. The telescope can rotate separately and move and point wherever the sun is in the sky. So that's what DKIS looks like in a conceptual drawing. This is what it actually looks like inside the telescope dome. So from this perspective, we're looking 
down onto the main mirror of the telescope from up above. And so sunlight would come down. It's actually shining here on the dome. You're getting ready to look at sunlight, but not quite looking at sunlight yet. So the sunlight would shine down onto this mirror, and then it would re reflect back up to this structure up here. And then it would get bent around underneath the telescope and then go down into the instrument lab. And this is a movie from the very first instrument to be put onto the telescope. Um, I think it looks really cool. Um, there's, there's so much stuff going on. There's these big bubbles and little bright patches in between them and the dark lanes. Um, and it is all evolving on a time scale of about, let's see, it starts, ends at 1935 and starts, it's about 10 minutes. So the sun, this is the surface of the sun. This is a really typical patch of the surface of the sun. And it's changing around all the time. Um, when this movie came out in the news, people thought it kind of looked like caramel corn. And I can see that. It's mostly the same color, right? Hey, Sarah. Yeah. We have a question from Ryan in Longmont, Colorado. Okay, Wants cool. to know, how long have you guys been building DKIST? Ooh, the groundbreaking was in 2006, is that right? Or is that later? It's been a long time. But even before we started building it physically, it was being thought about um, and modeled and people were designing parts for it and thinking about how we would use it. So it's really been a long-term effort. Even like 20 years ago, our director would say he was thinking about this project, how it would be used and how it would drive the, the science of looking at the sun forward. So it's been a long time. Good question, thanks. So the, the fact that this, people said this looked like popcorn kind of got us thinking up the, the telescope. So I was, it was like one of the first days I was going up to the telescope to actually do work to put the instrument up there that I'm working on. And I was riding back down in the van with a couple of engineers and one of them asked me how much popcorn could Dekus pop? And I thought about it and at the time I said, I don't know. But then I said, I can figure it out. So I wanted to rephrase the question a little bit. It's not just how much popcorn decus could pop because energy and light is coming into decus all the time. So it's really a question of how much popcorn could decus pop per second. And we're not necessarily interested in popping popcorn down the, in the instrument lab what we really want to use is where the sunlight is first concentrated by the main mirror. So the question I pose is how much popcorn could decus pop per second using the concentrated sunlight from the main mirror? Um, so we're going to answer this using the scientific method. So you might see the scientific method phrased a little bit differently than what, how I say it here, um, but it has a couple of basic steps. And the very first step is asking the question. So we see something in nature, or maybe we see a lever and we don't know what it's for. So we wanna pull that lever, but we don't know what it does. So first we ask the question, what is the lever for? We make a hypothesis about what it does. We might look at things around the lever to see if uh, anything there will tell us what it does. Maybe if there's something written or something around to indicate what it's for. But if there's nothing around, well, we can hypothesize maybe it does something or maybe it doesn't do anything. 
we make a prediction based on the hypothesis. If I pull the lever, something happens. Or if I pull the lever, something doesn't happen. And then we test that with an experiment. So we pull the lever and in this case, got zapped by lightning. Um, then we analyzed the results. Well, getting zapped by lightning wasn't really that fun. And finally, we repeat the process. A normal person might say, well, it got zapped by lightning when I pulled the lever, so I won't do that again. But a scientist would say, I got zapped by lightning when I pulled the lever. But was that coincidence or did the pulling the lever cause the lightning to happen? And a scientist knows that it's actually very rare for lightning to strike twice. So if you pull the lever again and get zapped, it's pretty likely that the lever will zap you every time you pull it. But if you pull the lever and you don't get zapped, then it was just a coincidence that you got struck by lightning at that time of pulling the lever. Okay, so this is the scientific method. And this is what we're gonna use to try and answer this question. We're not gonna go through the full method. Really what I'm focusing on here is asking the question. So we have a question already about how much popcorn decrease could pop. And then we're gonna make a hypothesis based on that. But we don't really have enough information just thinking about, oh, how much popcorn could be could pop. We really have to make a prediction based on some calculations. So we're gonna make predictions to form our hypothesis into something that seems valid. And then maybe we could test it with a scaled down version of DECUS, not the actual telescope. So making a good hypothesis is pretty important for scientists. Um, we might design our experiment and do analysis of the results that depend on what we assumed initially. So often the hypothesis is based on calculations that we do. Um, we might make assumptions about how something happens or behaves or why it does that. And then we try and fill in as much information as possible with things we already know already based on previous experiments or just general knowledge. Um, and then the rest we would try and fill in with educated guesses. Maybe we found something similar to what we're thinking about and we try and apply that to, to the problem. So I should say, this is a silly question of how much popcorn DECUS could pop. It's, DECUS is a really powerful new telescope. And the time that we have to do observations is very precious and expensive and involves a lot of people to run the telescope and then analyze the results. Actually running this experiment might, might actually hurt people or equipment at the telescope. So we're probably not gonna run it ever. No one's never ever gonna let me run this. But it's really fun to think about popping popcorn with DECUS. So it's a, it's a silly question and it's fun to think about, but we probably won't do it. Um, I should also say you should never ever look at the sun directly with your eyes for a long time, and especially never look at the sun through a telescope or binoculars, which focus the light and make it more concentrated. Galileo and Newton were really smart guys, but they both looked through their telescopes at the sun and suffered the consequences. So, don't be like them. They were smart, but not smart enough. We learned from their experiment. So why would we want to use DKIS to pop popcorn? So we already know that sunlight has a lot of energy. You go outside and the sun feels warm. That's the energy getting absorbed into your skin. Um, you can take a magnifying glass and collect more sunlight into a tiny beam and you focus it on a piece of paper and you can actually start to burn that piece of paper. So there's a lot of energy in sunlight. Uh, DECUS is like a really big magnifying glass. So it's four meters across. So that's about 13 feet. It's huge. That's uh, bigger than this room I'm in. It's about the length of a small size sedan or a Kia Rio. Um, and the mirror itself is dished, it's curved, so it focuses the light into a small area and it concentrates the sunlight into that small area. 
so that the concentrated energy can heat things up really quickly. So you could think about cooking something really fast, like popcorn, using the sunlight from the telescope. So first I'm gonna break this question down because how much popcorn could Dika's pop is a big question. Um, I wanna break it down to, into smaller pieces so that we can solve those more easily. So these come down to questions about the size of things. And it comes down to the question of how much time it takes to do things. So for size, how much popcorn can you heat at once? And how quickly does the popcorn actually pop? Those are our two main questions here. So for how much popcorn can you heat at once? Uh, we might ask how big is the image of the sun that may, is made by the telescope mirror? How concentrated does the sunlight get there? Um, and how many popcorn kernels can we fit in that region? Then for time, how quickly does the popcorn pop is affected by how much energy is in the image of the sun? And then we kind of need to know something about what makes popcorn actually pop. Um, but then we need to know how much energy it takes for the popcorn to pop. So we're gonna figure that out. And we also need to know how much space does the popcorn take up afterwards? Because it's fun to know that. So, in figuring out how big the beam of light from DKIST becomes when it's focused, we have to know something about optics. So this is not DKIST. It's actually a lens and a candle. So we're gonna pretend here that the candle is the sun and the lens is the DKIST main mirror. So a lens is not the same as a mirror, but you can use them to do the same kind of thing. So a lens and a mirror can both focus light. And in this case, the light from the candle is focused on a screen over here. And this is gonna be our popcorn popper. Okay, so knowing something about the distances between the sun and the mirror, and then the distance from the mirror to the image, which is our popcorn popper. And we know something about the size of the sun. We can figure out how big that image of the sun is going to be. So how big is the region where we need to put our popcorn? And it turns out when you do the calculation using the equations for optics, you find out that the sun becomes an image of about 70 millimeters across at the main focus of the DKIS telescope. So how many popcorn kernels can we fit there? Well, 70 millimeters, I've got a ruler here, is seven centimeters. And that's a couple of inches, maybe two and three quarter inches. So I took this ruler and I went around my house to try and find something that was about 70 millimeters round. And I've got a lot of glasses and stuff, but I actually found this jar lid that is 70 millimeters across and 70 millimeters, seven centimeters. So this is really handy. You probably have one of these at home. Uh, so I took this jar lid and I got out my popcorn kernels and I filled it up and I put it in in a nice thin layer and tried to make sure there weren't too many gaps. And I, then I counted up the popcorn kernels and it turns out there's about 92 popcorn kernels that fit in that 70 millimeter circle. So now we know how much popcorn we can fit in there. Another big question is how much sunlight does the telescope collect? Well, from college, I know that sunlight has a particular density on the energy density on the ground. So um, you go outside and look at the ground 
And that's the equivalent sunlight to 1100 watt bulbs. So if you took 1100 watt bulbs and shone them all down on the ground outside, and you also had sunlight falling on the ground, that would be the same brightness. So dekist is four meters, not just one meter by one meter on a side. So dekist is four meters across. It has a much larger area and it can actually fit a lot of light bulbs in it. It collects so much light. It's still going, still going. More light bulbs. Okay, there we go. So that's the number of light bulbs worth of sunlight that Dekist can collect over its main mirror. And it turns out, I did the calculation, it's about 140 100 watt bulbs. And all of that sunlight is collected and then focused, and it's focused into that tiny 70 millimeter circle that's just little. So the, the something, the length of a car is collecting all the sunlight and focusing it in this tiny circle. So there's a lot of energy that gets concentrated into that tiny circle. And get, it can get really hot. Okay, so how much sunlight heats up the popcorn? We almost have this under our belt. So we know how much sunlight gets collected into that 70 millimeter circle. Now we have to figure out how big a popcorn kernel is and I still have my ruler here so I can measure that. Uh, popcorn kernel might be, let's see, maybe you can see what I'm doing here. Uh, maybe nine millimeters, one direction, and let's see, maybe five or six millimeters in the other direction, sort of an ellipse. It's not, it's not round, it's not square. Um, but we can figure out the area based on those numbers. Another important thing about how much sunlight is able to heat the popcorn up is actually the color. And this is kind of a advanced topic. Um, but when we think about um, like things like asteroids out in space, the color is important um, because it determines how much sunlight they can absorb to heat up. And so if they're very bright white, that means that they're not absorbing very much energy. Um, and if they're black, well, that means they're actually absorbing all of the energy. So the surface will get pretty warm. Um, so a popcorn kernel is yellow. Yeah. Um, so it might be absorbing about half of the radiation and maybe it's reflecting another, the rest of it. So maybe it's absorbing just about half that energy that the sun gives it. And the rest is scattered out into the environment. So we could say, if I do the calculation, maybe each popcorn kernel gets uh, heated by about 50 watts of sunlight. And that's about half of one of our light bulbs that I showed before. Um, so now we know how much power it sees. Uh, so why does popcorn pop is really the next question we have to answer in this journey. So popcorn is made up of pretty much just starch or carbohydrates, that's most of it, but it has a little bit of water inside the kernel as well, and it has an outer shell, which is sort of like a balloon, stretchy balloon on the outside. Well, not very stretchy, it's hard, but um, so first of all, the kernel gets heated up when we're making popcorn. Um, maybe you make it in a pan or maybe you make it in the microwave, but no matter what happens, it has to warm up first. And the water inside the kernel is actually what is important here. So the water gets warm and it starts to turn into steam when the kernel is heated. 
and the steam increases the pressure inside the shell of the kernel. And when the pressure inside becomes too large for the kernel, the shell of the kernel to contain, the shell pops open. And uh, people, uh, these people, uh, these authors, uh, Viro and Ponomarenko, wrote this paper about the temperature of um, that popcorn pops at. And they found that it was about 180 degrees C or 356 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I really encourage you, if you are interested in the science of popcorn, uh, go look at this paper. And I pulled out the plot from their paper here. And it shows that um, almost all of the popcorn kernels in their experiment have popped by the time they, it reaches 180 degrees centigrade. And they sort of start popping maybe around 150 or 160 degrees, but all of them have popped by the time they reach 180 degrees. Okay, so we know a little bit about what makes popcorn pop, but we have to figure out now how much energy is needed to make a kernel of popcorn pop. So I said before, we have to heat up the popcorn kernel. So essentially we have to heat the kernel from room temperature or the average temperature inside DKIS, which is about 20 degrees Celsius. And then we have to heat it up to about 180 degrees Celsius to the point at which the kernel will pop. But there's a little bit more energy we need, which is the energy to turn the water in the popcorn into steam. And that is different from the energy just needed to heat up the popcorn. So I did the calculation and I found out that the energy needed to heat the popcorn to the temperature we want is about 70 joules. So joules is a measure of energy. And the energy needed to turn the water from liquid to steam is about 50 joules. So almost half and half um, energy just to heat it up and then energy to actually turn the water to steam inside. So we add those together, about 120 joules are needed to pop one kernel of popcorn. So now that we know how much energy we need to pop the popcorn and we know how much energy DKIST gives us, we can figure out uh, how long it takes to pop one kernel of popcorn. So this is sort of an, an analogy to distance, time, and speed. So distance divided by time is equal to our speed. If we're driving in a car, we can drive a certain number of miles and that takes us a particular amount of time. And we can calculate our average speed based on that in miles per hour. So the same is true for energy and power. So energy divided by time is the power. So energy measured in joules and time measured in seconds gives us joules per second. And a joule per second is a watt. Um, so I have a power from the telescope in watts and a required energy for the popcorn in joules. And I can figure out the time then from that by uh, di dividing those two quantities. So the time it takes for DKIS to pop a kernel of popcorn is about two seconds. So how much popcorn could DKIS pop every second? Well, that's now a really easy math problem. So we have 92 kernels unpopped. We wait two seconds and then they pop. 92 kernels popped is about 0.8 liters. So we could make about 0.4 liters of popped corn every second using DKIS. A liter is about the same as a quart. So I have uh, my quart jar here full of popcorn. So this is an amount of popcorn that DKIS could make every two seconds. You can sort of imagine one, two, three, just popcorn flying out of it. <laughs> 
So is it time to run an experiment? Well, as I said before, we have this nice hypothesis, which is now based on these, these physical assumptions. We've done a calculation, which is pretty careful, gives us a, a, a rough estimate of how much popcorn we could make in the amount of time. But no one will really let me run this experiment using a telescope. It's probably a fire hazard. You would end up with people walking around eating popcorn all the time and getting butter on all the optics. And it's probably a fire hazard. The popcorn might light on fire after you popped it. I don't know. But we could actually do this experiment. We could scale down the size of the mirror by a factor of 10 and build a different telescope with a much smaller mirror and pop one kernel at a time. So my proposal for this is called Sun Popped. So that's the Sun Powered Popcorn Telescope. And uh, maybe I'll try and find some uh, money to build it someday. But that's basically popping popcorn with Dekist. Thanks a lot for listening. And I have to give a huge shout out to Lyle for giving the me this idea. It sort of blossomed from being a tiny kernel of popcorn into a big tasty uh, piece of popcorn. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. And I should say, Tishana, now any questions? Yeah, so just a reminder, if any of you have questions out there, you can go ahead and leave them in the chat on our YouTube page, and we'll pass them along to Dr. Yegli. So we have one from Ryan in Longmont. He's asking, how long ago was it for us to start thinking that the sun looked like popcorn? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that was a comment that came out of the, when we did the press release for the new observations that we took. So that was only since January or the end of January. Um, I don't know. Maybe people always kind of thought it looked like popcorn. Well, how long has popcorn been around? <laughs> okay, another question is, how long do you think it would take to pop a bag of popcorn? A bag of popcorn? I guess it depends on how big the bag of popcorn it is. Um, so this is 0.8 liters. So I said 0.4 liters uh, per second. Right? Um, I mean, one of those big um, popcorn containers that you get at the movie theater is like a, a, over a hundred ounces. I think, I think I figured out that that was five liters of popcorn. So let's see. Five liters of popcorn at 0.4 liters per second is 12 and a half seconds. <laughs> cool. So not very long. No, that's really fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question comes from Sue Romis. She wants to know if this experiment would be different if done at sea level or how at elevation. Oh, yeah. So the, the pressure inside the kernel will be higher. So I think that I think this means that the popcorn pops faster. So the pressure at elevation up at the summit is a little bit less than it is down uh, next to the ocean. Um, so there's less pressure outside of the kernel. And so when the pressure inside the kernel starts increasing, um, it'll rupture more quickly. So yeah, I think it'll take a little bit less time. I didn't take that into account in my uh, calculation. Sorry, Sue. Uh, so we have a question from Pagils. Uh, they're asking, 
So this goes back to the sun looking like popcorn and how the new images came out and that's sort of when people started saying that it looks like caramel corn and things like that. Uh, they're asking, did the old images show that texture? And is it because the new images now have the texture that it looks like popcorn? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the, the new images that we took do look a lot like the old images that we took, but we're just able to see much finer features in it and things that are changing much more clearly. So old images look like popcorn and new images look like popcorn too. They, they look about the same, but it's just the resolution that we're seeing. Question from Rebecca. Does this experiment scale to a smaller telescope? So if we use a smaller telescope, we have to scale the mirror down exactly. So I was talking before about um, a little bit about the focal length of the mirror and the, and the diameter. So if we scale the problem down, we have to scale the focal length of the mirror and the diameter of the mirror together. So the, the focal ratio, that's what it's called, will be the same number for a big telescope or a small telescope, even though the mirrors are different sizes and the focal lengths are different. Um, but we can't, we can't scale it down to really small because otherwise our popcorn kernel won't fit in the beam. So it has to be at least big enough to fit the popcorn kernel in there. And sorry, I have a correction to the last question. So um, Rebecca actually asked this question, which was not the last question. She asked what happens to the heat in DCIS? Ah, so this is a, a very important aspect of the telescope. So I've been talking about using this full 70 centimeters, or uh, sorry, not 70 centimeters, 70 millimeters, seven centimeter circle to use it for popping popcorn. And what actually happens at that place in the telescope is there's a tiny little hole in the middle and a big reflective surface on the front. So the, a tiny little hole. So it's basically a mirror and all of the sunlight there gets reflected back out the telescope and a little bit of sunlight goes through the hole and down into the instruments. So we're getting rid of most of the light from the sun and just sending a little bit down to the instruments. But this surface, even though it's reflective, very shiny like a mirror, it still gets hot. So the whole thing has to be cooled by a fire hose of water, like forcing through the back um, and then back out to get get cooled back down again. So it has to very rapidly carry the energy from the sunlight away. It's a big problem and it's a really important problem for the telescope. Well, that was a great question. Um, so we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Yegley, for this awesome presentation. And I hope you guys can tune in next time for our Learn From Home webinar. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for listening.